In this next lecture, in this next section, I want to continue our description, our discussion of descriptive approaches to time series analysis, uh, focusing specifically on detrending and differencing. So starting with detrending, um, remember that one of the goals in classical time series analysis is to meet this assumption of stationarity, that there's a uh, constant mean and that the um, correlation structure is just a function of lag in time uh, rather than act the, you know, the absolute specific time that you're looking at. So that, those assumptions is uh, second order of stationarity. Um, when we're talking about exploratory analyses, uh, what we can often think about is, is a three-step process where we start by estimating the trend, such as smoothing, which is what we covered in the last lecture. We can then calculate the residuals uh, from that trend, you know, so remove the, the trend using a smoother of some sort, look at the residuals, and then analyze the residuals as a time series uh, with the trend removed to look for um, you know, how the, the autocorrelation changes as a function of lag. Uh, we'll know that that is, is really intended as an exploratory analysis, not as a formal statistical analysis. If we're doing a, building a formal statistical model, what we're going to want to do is be thinking about the fact that our predicted y as a function of time involves some model describing the trend and some autocorrelated error structure. So we're going to be write down a, a trend, a, a process model to describe our trend, and we're going to write down a data model that describes the autocorrelated na nature of our error. And we'll cover how to do that uh, in a couple lectures ahead. But for now, let's start with thinking about how we do this in a more exploratory mode. So remember, the goal here in, in uh, achieving stationarity is, is you want to residuals that have uh, a mean of 0. In many cases, we were going to look for a normal distribution or some other named distribution. Uh, we're hopefully going to find residuals that are homoscedastic, that the variance is not changing with time. Because if the, the magnitude of the variance was changing with time, that would definitely violate that assumption of second order stationarity that only distance in time measure, not the absolute time. Uh, but it is worth noting that it is OK for the residuals to still be autocorrelated after you've removed a trend, because you know, uh, you know, that's kind of what one of the things that uh, classical time series is looking to assess is whether that um, those residuals are autocorrelated. It doesn't mean that you violated assumptions, it means that you then have to address that autocorrelation. But here's an example of, of residuals from, from the lowest models we'd looked at uh, in the previous lecture, and then plotting a histogram of those residuals that you know really do look approximately normal. The variance does look fairly constant. It doesn't seem to be an obvious trend. I mean, there are some wiggles uh, you know, with some memory suggesting there is some autocorrelation here. To the, these larger wiggles more than you would see with white noise, uh, but generally it's the sort of thing that looks fairly good uh, for a time series. So the other thing that can help to trend in addition to smoothing is is differencing. Uh, often it helps to trend the data and can increase stationarity. So differencing, you know, for example, for looking at just the first difference, we'd be calculating you know, the change in x as, you know, the x at this time point minus x at the previous time point. Uh, differencing can help us understand our process better uh, because when you think about a lot of the classic process models we, we work with, they're often written down in terms of uh, how x changes rather than x itself. So you can do a growth model or a pool and flux model or a state and transition model. They're often written in terms of how X changes. And this was true of the dynamic models we talked about when we were talking about state space models in the previous section. Uh, it's also true that sometimes when you difference things, you find that uh, the differences are not autocorrelated. So if you have a Markovian process, even if uh, the data may be highly autocorrelated because the process model may be you know, directional, sometimes the um, uh, 
differences are not autocorrelated. You know, we might uh, basically account for the memory in the system. And you know, uh, in addition to the fact that many models are written in terms of change in x, others are often written uh, in terms of derivatives. And, and really, uh, differences is just a discrete approximation of de der derivatives. Um, so again, if we think about first difference as being the difference uh, in how x changes over from one time point to the next, there's also the concept of a lag difference. Instead of, so instead of looking at how x changed to one time point in the past, we might be looking at how x changed n time points in the past, so a, a slower, longer memory process. And we can also look at uh, second differences or higher order differences, such as you know, how you know, delta x changed from one time point to the next, uh, which is you know, instead of appro approximating a first derivative, it would be approximating a second derivative. There's a fairly simple function in R to calculate these uh, first and second differences and lag differences. It's just the function diff. So if we have this original time series here, we can look at this first difference, which uh, now has much less autocorrelation, has much less, uh, much more constant variance, uh, much closer to the assumptions we're looking for, no obvious trend here, and same with the, the second difference. And again, coming back to you know, classical time series and population modeling concepts, uh, one thing that's often interesting in the population models are the really the, the detect and model density dependence, which is when our rate of change in something, which is a population, changes as a function of n. And so you know, there we might take our, our first differences and instead of plotting them against time, as we see in this top panel, we might plot them against uh, the population status, their state variable itself. Uh, here, seeing how that, that change in x uh, showed a clearly nonlinear relationship to the to x itself. So the growth rate changed as a function of uh, the state variable itself. <clears throat> 